You are listening to Reach MD, the channel for medical professionals. Hello, this is Dr. Michael Davidson, president of the National Lipid Association. I'd like to welcome you to Lipid Illuminations, hosted by Dr. Alan Brown and presented by the National Lipid Association. We all know the health benefits of being fit and in shape. However, getting our patients to adjust their behaviors, even slightly, can be a huge problem. We're all looking for strategies to provide for our patients so they can be successful with their behavioral changes. Joining me today is Dr. John Ferret, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavior Medicine Research and Director of the DeBakey Heart Center's Behavioral Medicine Research Center at Baylor College of Medicine. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So over the years, John, you've taught me a tremendous amount about how to approach behavior with patients, and I am really excited to have you on the show today to share some of that information with our audience. So let's start with where we are today with obesity. You had predicted for me in the past that by 2100, we predicted that 100% of Americans would be obese and one in three will be diabetics. Are those numbers just so staggering or have they improved somewhat? Well, the new data suggests that the uh, prevalence has slowed down a little bit, but the truth is, I still believe by the year 2100, I've now changed from 100% to 98% of us will be obese or certainly close to being obese. So, you know, this goes along with the whole world. One third of the world now is already overweight or obese. By the year 2030, if this trend's continued, 58% of the world's population will be overweight or obese. So the issue is, what the heck are we going to do about it? Well, that's a great question. I- You know, our group had actually looked at the health reform bill back when we got the first House version because we could divide it up into 100-page segments and read it. And now, you know, (laughs) we haven't had a lot of time to review it. But from what I saw, there's nothing in there about dealing with better choices for our patients. Same thing, Alan. I agree with you that we're just not seeing any active involvement to really try to stop the increasing prevalence. So if it were your health care reform plan to try and reduce illness in the future, John. How would you approach it? And, you know, why do we have this continuing increase in body weight? Well, we have the continuing increase in body weight because of our environment. That is, you know, we're all working too hard. We have too many jobs. We have no time to exercise. We have the availability of high-calorie, high-fat foods, stress, tension, anxiety, depression, loneliness, anger, boredom, all kinds of emotional eating, So we're eating somewhere between 134 and 300 more calories a day than we did 10 years ago. So roughly about 200 extra calories a day. And there's the problem. So how do we reduce all the stress, anxiety, and boredom? That's an answer you never gave me. Those are what the lifestyle strategies, all of the behavior modification strategies are aimed at specifically dealing with both the environmental and the emotional factors that are influencing our intake of diet and uh, our, you know, lack of physical activity. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks, John. If you had, you know, the 15-minute office visit and you wanted to provide patients with some helpful hints to help them, you know, have a healthier lifestyle and particularly to lose weight, what would be your approach and what behavioral strategies would you... Yes, ideally, you know, when we have time, we take an hour with a patient. But I know physicians don't have the time to help their patients with all of the lifestyle strategies that patients face, all of the issues that they face in their daily lives. So what we've tested, and other people have tested and published it also, is that if you as a physician have, say, 10 to 15 minutes with a patient, a streamlined approach would involve first, a look at what the patient is eating and physical activity. So if they have met with you before and you've insisted they keep a food diary and an exercise diary, terrific. If they haven't, you ask them about what kind of eating and exercise problems they had since the last visit with you. After you do that, then you review their previous goals. So you look at what is it specifically that you've asked them to do or that they've agreed to do on their own. And then, depending what's working and what isn't, set new goals, maybe involve a little behavioral contract, like I agree to walk, you know, 20 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then try to make at least one change. And by doing that, what we find is small changes make an enormous medical benefit. And that's what we're all shooting for. Large changes are almost impossible to keep long-term, but small changes, walking a little bit more, watching a little less television, using your computer a little bit less and getting up and walking around, those things are doable and they make a heck of a difference over the long term. 
So, John, you mentioned these different strategies. One of them was a diary for diet, and other was maybe a contract with the patient. Are there other effective behavioral strategies that we should use in our armamentarium? Absolutely. You know, the most powerful one, again, if you only had time to do one, it is this whole concept, behavioral concept of raising awareness in your patient. So that involves, you know, a physical activity, such as having the patient use a pedometer, or if they're not doing that, just count 20 minutes of walking, you know, and is 100 calories. And, you know, just go with that kind of little simple strategy. You know, a food diary or just ask them what they ate at night, you know, because that's where the problems are. And weigh on a regular schedule, you know, and for most of us, that means weigh every day. And those kind of things are doable, and they make all the difference in the world. If you had a little more time, you look at the, what are the barriers? Why isn't your patient making the environmental changes that they should be making? And by helping the patient identify those, like not enough time you know, to exercise, and then showing them we're at work, they can get up and from their computer and walk for 10 minutes, you're just looking at, again, the point is, Alan, is small changes make all the difference in the world. Stress management, they can sit at their desk and do a little bit of relaxation therapy. They can say to themselves, one, 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 you know, and fall into a relaxation response. There are simple things people can do that have a long-term effect if they did a little bit each day. You're burning a few calories, you're teaching your body to be more relaxed, and therefore, you know, you're not having this constant craving to eat all day long. So, John, do you think it's important for them to keep a calendar or put it on their outlook or whatever to do these things on a regular basis we find that people who do that lose more weight and you know and achieve more behavioral changes than people that don't absolutely any strategies like that where people are actually doing problem solving approaches you know what is the issue how can they structure their lives in such a way to make small changes so with your hour assuming that we can get people started in our 15 minutes with self monitoring a little bit and moving their body through space What additional things do you include in your hour visit? Well, we include a number of strategies. So we start with setting goals. And goal setting is absolutely critical because, you know, we work with a lot of obese patients that are trying to lose weight. They all want to lose 30 pounds overnight. So what we do is set realistic goals with the patient. What is a reasonable amount of weight to be lost? You know, one to two pounds a week overall. We raise their awareness through a diary, food diary and exercise diary and weighing on a regular schedule, we look at what are the primary barriers to keeping the patient from eating right and exercising like they should. And then we help them make one or two changes. We focus on what is the stress level of the patient and people who are under a lot of stress find it extraordinarily difficult to make these changes. So we teach them a simple stress management strategy. Physical activity is a good one. Yoga is a good one. Meditation is a good one. There are all kinds of strategies that, depending on tailoring to the patient, we restructure their cognitive abilities, meaning teaching them some affirmations. I can walk a little bit more. I can be a little more active on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I can walk for 15 minutes. Once they start making these changes, we also then incorporate preventing relapse. That is, all patients, all of us, from time to time, will go off of our scheduled strategy, and we teach them how to deal with those issues in the future. And most importantly, as healthcare professionals, we provide support. And support is so important. You guys know that by just telling a patient to stop smoking, some of them will do it. The same with lowering lipids by changing their diet, the same with lowering weight, by being very positive rather than negative. And then we have them sign a simple contract, I will walk, you know, Tuesday and Thursday for 15 minutes. And then our physicians will add pharmacotherapy if needed. But bottom line is you're looking at lifestyle strategies that can help a patient adhere to a diet and exercise program. The whole point of a healthy lifestyle means eating a healthy diet and being physically active. The behavioral factors are the strategies to help patients achieve this healthy lifestyle. So those are the ones I just outlined for you, and we cover those in an hour. I mean, we can do that. If you guys don't have the time to do that as physicians, then I'd recommend simply going to raising awareness through a diary and getting them to weigh on a regular schedule, look at what factors they had problems with since you last saw them, make sign a new contract making one change and usually walking is a good one or you know eating a little less snacks or something like that that is very simple to incorporate the bottom line that we've seen in all of our studies 
that small changes can make an enormous medical difference. You don't have to lose a lot of weight to lower your lipids to have a healthy, beneficial lifestyle. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Lipid Illuminations on ReachMD XM160. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, your host. We're talking today with Dr. John Ferret, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavior Medicine Research and the Director of the DeBakey Heart Center's Behavioral Medicine Research Center at Baylor College of Medicine. So, John, let's go back to some of the things you've told me over the years. One of the things that we always talk about is that the way you influence patients has little to do with what they think about you. It has more to do with how they feel about themselves and your presence. I wonder if you could talk about that. And then as one of the principal investigators of the Look Ahead trial, could you tell us a little bit about the study and how it's going? You know, the goal of really what you're doing in counseling is to have the patient feel very comfortable, feeling good about themselves. So the session with the patient is not about you, the physician, or you, the healthcare professional. It's about them, and getting them to feel comfortable in your presence is the goal. I mean, that's rapport, and that's the first step in any counseling strategy is to build rapport with your patient. And we've been doing that in the Look Ahead trial The Look Ahead trial, for those of the listeners that are not aware of it, the aim of our trial, Look Ahead, is to determine whether CVD morbidity and mortality in obese subjects with type 2 diabetes can be reduced through these behavioral strategies I've just been talking about, aimed at losing weight and maintaining a small weight loss. So what we've done in the United States is recruit and randomize over 5,000 obese subjects with type 2 diabetes in 16 sites around the United States. We're all doing the same thing, and the trial itself is lasting 13 years. So what we've been doing is teaching these behavioral skills that I've just been talking about to patients. It's a lifestyle strategy, pure and simple, and that's what we've been doing. What we found is at one year, these obese type 2 patients with diabetes have lost 8.6% of their body weight, which is fantastic. The study is powered at a 7% weight loss. So after one year, the intensive intervention group, the lifestyle group, has lost 8.6% compared to less than 1% in our control group. This is a randomized clinical trial. All of these changes that we've measured, of course, are significant other than LDL because both groups lost LDL because everyone's on a statin, it seems, and the effect of a statin, you know, is so powerful. But everything else is remarkably significant clinically and uh, statistically significant in the intensive intervention group with this relatively achievable weight loss goal of 8.6%. We're now assessing the long-term maintenance of these patients over a decade, seeing whether we can actually reduce morbidity and mortality in these intensive lifestyle patients compared to the control patients. And that's an extremely exciting finding. Remember, we have over 5,000 patients in this trial. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot of publications so far, and we have a lot more coming out. It's going to answer a lot of questions on the effect of small lifestyle changes on long-term cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And I'm assuming when you say the statistically significant benefits on everything else, you're talking about blood pressure, everything, lipids, fasting, glucose, HDL, and triglycerides. All of those plus many more. Again, the only one we didn't get changes was both groups lowered their LDL significantly. And we assume that's because of the statins. Well, that's certainly encouraging, John. Yes, it is. So, you know, based on this research and your overall experience, what would be the secrets of successful weight loss? You kind of gave us some general ideas about uh, making small changes. If you were to give more specifics, what should we tell our patients? If I had to summarize the small changes that a patient needs to make for successful weight loss and maintenance, based on the literature, what we found and other researchers in the field, there are several strategies First, every day, sleep eight hours. Number two, every day, eat breakfast. Number three, every day, walk briskly for whatever you can, but ideally up to 60 minutes. Next, write down what you eat and look up the calories. Weigh yourself every day. Find a good support system. It can be you, the physician, another healthcare professional. It can be your spouse or a close friend, a neighborhood, but a good support system who's also working on their small changes. And finally, never, never give up. Well, thank you very much, John. I think there are several pearls in this discussion that hopefully our listeners will be able to use in their office. Oh, thank you for having me, Alan. 
Thank you for listening to Lipid Luminations presented by the National Lipid Association. For more information, visit www.lipid.org.